Today on PMEA's Take Note podcast, we are talking about Play on Philly with their founder and executive director, Stanford Thompson. It's all on today's PMEA's Take Note podcast, presented by the Slippery Rock University Music Department. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Take Note podcast. Uh, today, joining me is Stanford Thompson. Uh, he is the founder and executive director of Play on Philly. We're going to find out what that is, what they offer, and uh, maybe some things that you can take away from that. Stan, thanks for taking some time to talk to us today. Mark, thanks so much for having me. So let's start with kind of the baseline uh, for folks who may not have heard of this since we're, we're, we're statewide. Uh, what is Play on Philly? So Play on Philly uh, provides high quality music education to students who would typically lack access um, as really a vehicle for life skills and academic achievement. Um, we provide over two hours of music instruction and ensemble practice every day after school. Um, and the students take place in about 25 performance opportunities throughout the year as well. Um, students range from the um, age of pre-kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. They're loan um, instruments at no cost. Um, all programs are provided tuition free. Um, and over the past 11 years, we've seen some pretty amazing results with our students, um, not only scoring higher academically, but also showing uh, better pro-social behaviors um, and just being more um, uh, academically motivated um, attending school more, um, things like that. So it's been, um, you know, a lot over the years, but, you know, in a nutshell, uh, that's what Play on Philly does. So uh, taking a look around uh, your website, I see, you know, you use teaching artists, which is certainly the, the kind of the mold of, of groups like this. But one of the things that I thought was really interesting about what you all were doing um, is that those teaching artists are provided with some professional development opportunities. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. So we provide over 40 hours of professional development for our teaching artists. I mean, our, our teachers are not like for example, within our public school systems across the state of Pennsylvania, even across the country, um, you know, usually coming with a degree in music education, um, our teachers are typically um, trained as performers, instrumentalists and vocalists um, that a lot of times lack the classroom experience. So we supplement that lack of experience with a lot of uh, hands-on training, um, not only at the beginning of the year, but also a lot of support throughout the year so they can become as effective in the classroom as possible. So I would imagine uh, that a teaching artist would be really receptive to, to that kind of supplemental instruction for them uh, because that's just good for their knowledge base, but then that's certainly good for the students that they're teaching. Is that, I mean, is it fair to say they're very receptive? Yeah, fair to say. And also would just add, I mean, it's a, a, a lot in terms of, you know, additional responsibilities than just teaching. And, you know, certainly not probably the best substitute for those that spend a couple of years of their lives, um, you know, getting music education degrees, um, but certainly a way to help them be effective in our model of a program. And a lot of times it's a, you know, professionally trained bassoonist teaching a small group of four to six bassoonists in the room. Um, and while they still have, you know, a lot of challenges, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the background the kids come from, um, of course, the just day-to-day -day challenges of just keeping a kid engaged um, in learning music, that a lot of the training ends up helping them that's very specific to our classroom environments. And, and I would also uh, imagine, you know, a lot of teaching artists are, are, you know, do private lessons, but a lot of that is one-on-one. -on -one. So right. to your point there, you know, that isn't that that's an added thing that you really have to think about, you know, if, okay, you're, you are the bassoon teacher or if you're the teaching artist and there you are with now five bassoon players in front of you coming with their own unique challenges at their own skill level. So uh, 
I mean, I think I think that's a wonderful uh, a wonderful add on then, and something that you all are obviously thinking about uh, in, when you're talking with your teaching artists. Correct, and a different environment than perhaps 35 kids in the room in a general music class. Um, and I think all of that takes just a different level of mastery of the art of teaching in addition to the mastery of the content itself. Right. I think, it, you know, uh, there's, there's probably, you know, we might think of what a model of education looks like. Uh, and it's probably the same model that's been for decades where there's a classroom with chairs and a teacher in the front of the room and there's a blackboard and they say this is what this is, but the model uh, really, if you think about it, has changed in so many ways, uh, in a scholastic sense, uh, in a in a private sense, and just the way that we all learn. Uh, and also, then you add the technology piece into our world now, and that's changed so much. So um, I'm then curious, just to talking about you know where the education front goes is how does uh, what Play on Philly does intersect with scholastic music education programs? So. In the schools that we work in, many of the schools uh, we have offered to help supplement um, and support their in-school music teachers. So for example, a lot of times um, our schools will have anywhere between 60 to 120 kids learning instrumental music after school. Those instruments are sitting in the closet during the school day. So we wanna make those instruments available to students during the school day. And in some of the schools, we've also provided some additional help, maybe you know, a, a teacher or two that can help um, the in-school teacher start you know, a, um, a band class or an, an, or an orchestra ensemble of students for the very first time. Um, uh, we have provided support with getting instruments fixed, um, with providing staff support. I mean, how much time it takes to organize an in-school concert and get parents to come out. A lot of times that falls on the shoulders of the music teacher. Um, so if our staff can take on that work, get flyers put up, um, get the auditorium set up, um, you know, get parents to sign up to bring in snacks for a reception afterwards. Um, we also wanna play that role um, and I think just working with the principal to highlight the importance that while our model of program every single day after school might not work for every kid in the building, we also think it's important for every child to have access um, to music learning during the school day. Um, and we wanna do that in partnership with the in-school teacher. Um, and in some cases, we've also even provided funding to the school so that perhaps a teacher can move from being a part-time itinerant teacher to a full-time presence in that school. Um, again, hired by the school, managed by the school principal, um, but able to do much more than what the school was able to do um, on its own. So uh, I, fair to say that you are an and, not an or. You know, you're, you wanna be in addition and, 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 and partner with those scholastic programs not just say to your students, you know, hey, be part of this and not part of that. You're an and, not an or. Right, and look, it's a, it's a good issue to have that there are more kids during the school day that are playing that then feel more motivated to stay after school and really geek out on it. Right. Um, and, you know, I mean, again, music is not for every child to find themselves. Um, I think it's good for kids that do after school sports or tutoring or different activities. But you know, I think it's important for a kid to learn something outside of academic pursuits um, that they can really feel motivated and proud of. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's a great way to put it and just provide, and, and I just love that you're providing that opportunity for it. So uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, this, the background of this and what it is. Uh, what, looking to the future, What's what's the vision for playing on Philly? Do you have uh, bigger plans? What what are you what are you thinking moving forward? Sure. So I mean, I'm really proud of what we do throughout the school year, and you know now we're in six locations um, and uh, have somewhere around 350, coming up on 400 kids. I think for the future we want to be able to serve. You know, in the next you know four years, we want to be able to serve about 700 kids annually through our regular programs throughout the year. And then also expand our summer camp. 
um, currently we offer six weeks um, in residence at Temple University um, and um, provide programming for the entire day, roughly from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, but, you know, we're also thinking, what could this program look like as an overnight camp? Mm -hmm. um, what if we could also fly kids into Philadelphia um, uh, that would not be able to afford other summer camp experiences? Um, and I think really develop Philadelphia as a place in the summertime where kids that, that come from, um, you know, lower socioeconomic um, you know, locations can still learn music and be inspired by uh, great teachers and conductors like you would at any of the kind of premier uh, summer music camps. Um, and uh, so I would certainly say there we want to do more with um, how we train teachers. We want to provide more pathways for our students that um, are thinking about a career in music, if it's in performing or music education, therapy, you know, business, that we are providing those pathways starting in high school for them to learn about those careers and then be properly supported and in getting into competitive colleges and hopefully returning back to play on Philly um, in a job, um, teaching perhaps maybe a job, my job someday. So um, right. that's, that's how big in the next couple of years that we're, or the direction we're thinking of heading, knowing it could take us the next decade to fully develop those programs um, and make sure they're sustainable. So, and if folks want to learn more about this and about the model, the website is playonphilly.org. Um, I, I certainly suggest you take a look at that, you know, find out about the programs and especially if you're in the Philly area um, that, you know, to, 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 to understand that, but of course, statewide, potentially there is some, some modeling that, that can be done. Um, so I want to, I want to shift gears a, a little bit because um, I was looking actually on your personal website and I saw a blog post uh, that, that you had posted a few years ago. Uh, and I, I just, I, since I had you, I thought this is a, per, you know, let's, let's chat about this a little bit. Um, and it was about shifting power in American orchestras. And I'm not going to try to paraphrase what it, you know, what you wrote, because you're here, I'd rather you do that. So um, can you kind of explain that to us? What, you know, if you could explain what your blog post was for us. Sure. So, I mean, for the most part, the, the blog post was around um, you know, currently who holds power within American orchestras, not just on stage, but back in the boardrooms, you know, the staff, um, you know, uh, even donors. And, you know, I think that there have been missed opportunities over the years in recognizing that there are multiple voices that are, have been trying to speak within this genre of music making that have been ignored. I also think there are a lot of leaders, um, potential board members, same thing, that voices have not really emerged. Um, and I think that's one thing that we have been talking a lot about, especially um, you know, since the murder of George Floyd, of uh, really recognizing you know, what voices haven't been told um, through this. So, in many ways, um, you know, this is uh, maybe a kick that I've been on for a long time because you know, I grew up in Atlanta um, and uh, grew up with, um, you know, the, the world of hip hop. I guess you could argue that Atlanta was a very important city with the development of hip hop, which I enjoy a lot. Um, but, you know, you know I'm a, I was, you know, a little black kid right outside of Atlanta who really fell in love with classical music. Um, and, you know, oftentimes my experiences, um, you know, made sour by a couple of people along the way um, that uh, did not make me feel as welcome in the space. But on that same token, I found dozens of other people that wanted to welcome me into the space and provide opportunities, um, but quickly found out that, you know, throughout the country, you know, even throughout our music schools and conservatories, our pre-professional ensembles or training institutions um, that, you know, again, that power um, isn't always as balanced as it could be. Um, so yeah, in short, there's so much more that we can do in providing opportunities for advancement and for, for mentorship. Um, 
and I just wanna you know, encourage my colleagues to do even more um, to kind of create a more equitable uh, balance. Yeah, and, and so to be clear, I mean, you, you, you know, this, the, the topic has certainly come to the forefront, as you mentioned, since George Floyd. Uh, but this blog post was written, you know, years before that. So, um, you know, this, this, this is not like you just said, okay, this happened, I'm going to write this. So um, you talk about, uh, I mean, conceptually, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with what you said. For sure. I mean, you just you look at the in an institution and that's you you see exactly what you're laying out. I think where folks say, OK, that is the now what? So as a musician, uh, as somebody who is a donor, somebody who is in power in these types of organizations, decision makers, um, you know, from your perspective, what are some actionable steps? What are some actual maybe thought process that they should go through and then some actual things they can do? Yeah, so I think one thing, you know, especially from an intellectual level is to really think about what systemic barriers have been created. Um, you know, so for example, in my space, um, I could not go into West Philly and just say, I'm starting a youth orchestra. Um, go get your own instruments. The audition is April 1st. Um, here's the list that you have to play. Um, and if you are selected to get in, in my case, a trumpet player, if you're one of the top five trumpet players that get in, then you have to pay this tuition fee. And then you see how this goes and you got to get your own weekly lessons because we only have time in our rehearsal to just, you know, work on the music and any other barrier that you have, you just have to figure it out. You got to be on rehearsal at on time. You can only miss a certain number of rehearsals until we take action against you. You know, I mean, those things don't work in every community. And I understand the rules are set up and, you know, to kind of protect the integrity of that experience for all the kids in it. Um, but from a systemic uh, system standpoint, you know, that really can keep a lot of people out of that club and out of that experience. So I think really the first question is just, you know, thinking about all of those barriers that are set up barriers to entry, barriers that exist to even participate? What are the barriers to even rise to the top? Um, because, you know, I would probably argue that in our top music schools, I mean, you're also rewarding a lot of kids, um, you know, aspiring professional musicians that already had a big advantage um, earlier on and, you know, even going back as early as elementary school. Um, so if those are the systems that are set up, I like to think the other way, what opportunities exist? So of course in West Philly, it was just like, I can't set up my youth orchestra program that way, but here's an opportunity. If we create a tuition-free program, we have the kids in every day, we're practicing with the kids every single day. Um, we're bringing in these great musical resources. Um, I think it creates a more compelling pitch to raise money. I think it's a more compelling pitch to get really great musicians and conductors and mentors out to work with the kids. Um, I think it provides opportunities for families that are a lot of times having a hard time finding quality out of school time engagement for their kids. Um, and if we can create a one-stop shop where this is a program they can put their kids in for the entire school year and for six weeks in the summer, I mean, that is a big help to families. The kids might not be that into music when they sign up. I mean, it's of course our job to engage them the best we can. Um, and that creates certain challenges, but I think in those challenges are even more opportunity. So, um, you know, I think, you know, after kind of examining those uh, systemic issues, then I like to say, you know, again, what are the opportunities within the challenges of reaching certain people and populations. And then a, in a design phase of just what types of activities could be created that would solve some of those problems. Um, so I think that um, that can be applied to how one looks at fundraising, how that looks at program design, community engagement, um, even outcomes and evaluation. And, you know, Mark, one big thing is that at the end of the day, 
um, if I compare myself to a, a traditional, you know, youth orchestra program, we can both say that our kids, you know, academically are at a better spot than their peers, that they, you know, are better prepared to go to college or maybe out to the workforce, um, that they are more self-confident, all of these things. But for a program that provides maybe two or three hours a week of a rehearsal, but then the kid and the parents have to go home and practice the other six days, who gets the prize? Is it that program that provides two or three hours a week or should the prize really be given to the kid and to the family? In our case, after providing 15 hours a week or so of you know, this music instruction and that guidance and a lot of handholding and financial support, then it's easier for Play on Philly, the organization, to get the prize for the transformation we see within kids. And I just think while that might be a lot more work <laughs> to, um, you know, get kids perhaps in the same spot, I think there's a way to be rewarded more um, for, for that type of change. And I would say in all of the spaces, how do we get more classical music to communities that tend not to consume it? Um, how do we get more music education out into rural parts of Pennsylvania? Harder to do, but I think so much more rewarding um, if we can kind of think of why do all of the great musical resources have to be based in Pittsburgh and you know Philly? Um, is there an opportunity even for some of our universities to step up and to think about fellowship programs where they can place graduates in rural communities um, and just kind of like the Peace Corps or something in a way? Um, so I think that's a huge opportunity that really could gather a lot of statewide or even local support, even philanthropic support. Uh, but you know, who, who will think about, again, what are those barriers out in rural Pennsylvania? How do we get music education out there and look at it as an opportunity rather than, geez, how are we gonna get a teacher out to the middle of nowhere um, and, you know, be effective in it? And I actually think there's a lot that can be done. Yeah, and I, so, I mean, I just love your kind of initial point of you're just, you're shifting your thinking that, uh, or, or, or an educator or someone taking on something like what, you know, what you've done is, is shifting your thinking. It's, you're, it's not what's the problem, it's what's the, what's the opportunity. And then how do you capitalize on that opportunity? And we know that's, that's tough for a music educator who is, you know, confined to whatever, you know, is going on in their school and whatever their curriculum is. But when a program like yours can come in, and say, hey, we're doing this, and you get you can learn from this, and and we can learn from each other in some ways. I think that's then how this, you know, your message, your goal, then grows. Fair point. Very fair. Yep. So um, I think this is really uh, important work, and I think it's important that for folks to to maybe just kind of follow along this journey because they're going to learn from what you're doing. And I think that's important, you know, for, for anyone to do just, you know, to, to see someone doing some good. And maybe you don't know that you have the capacity to do it or, or the know-how or whatever to do it. But when you see a program like yours doing it, that's really valuable for, for other folks in the space to learn from. Yeah. And I certainly, Mark, want to acknowledge that, you know, a lot of our educators throughout the state are facing a lot of you know, just day-to-day -day challenges. Uh, both of my parents are retired music educators um, in the Atlanta area, and I, I saw it firsthand. And I think a lot of the work that I do is in response to seeing how hard my parents work to make sure instruments got repaired. I'm sure they took a lot of money out of their own pocket <laughs> to right. uh, make those things happen. And I saw the number of hours they were spending after school with students and performances and, you know, trying to get them out to a local uh, professional performance uh, that might be going on in town. Um, and certainly I will say that even the success of Play on Philly is because a team came together. Um, and I do hope that those that are working really hard trying to make music education possible for young people um, can think about how can they make some space to develop the types of teams and tribes in a way 
that can join them in that work. Um, and I think that is that can be quite powerful because um, there are a lot of resources across the state. And I think there are a lot of uh, people willing to do something. Um, and I learned what I learned by just watching my parents be extremely resourceful um, and just pick up the phone, call the Atlanta Symphony and say, you know, can, can one of your musicians come out to the school? Can I get my kids in for a rehearsal or a performance? Um, can some of the musicians just stay for 15 minutes afterwards and, and talk to my students? Um, and just saw how far that went, even asking the local Home Depot um, or Coca-Cola, you know, UPS, some of the big companies, Delta, I remember my mom writing to Delta saying, hey, can you help us get some of our students out to a um, competition? And sure enough, Delta wrote back with tickets for the kids. So, you know, it was things like that of, um, you know, uh, I'm not afraid to ask. Um, perhaps I get told more no than yes. Uh, but I, I get enough yeses uh, right. to make something happen. And I'm sure there are a lot of educators that can uh, resonate with that. And I just want to encourage them to keep going, um, keep finding those opportunities and resources for their kids. And Play on Philly, we stand here ready to help the best we can, uh, share our story um, and share whatever resources we can. Well, uh, I think folks uh, will appreciate that. And again, I will, will tell folks to visit playonphilly.org uh, to find out more about that. So Stan, thank, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with, today, sir. chat with us today. Excuse me, I really appreciate it. Thanks again. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us on uh, PMEA's Take Notes podcast presented by the Slippery Rock University Music Department. We will see you next time.